Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, second part of the uh, summer school, uh, IIDF school. Uh, we finished the first part uh, with uh, Michael's talking today, and we learned a lot of things about the deep learning. Uh, maybe Michael uh, forgot to mention something uh, about the explainability, because you all know that we can uh, create a lot of uh, models in deep learning. It's like a leg Lego game, right? But we, it's, uh, they are uh, like a black box. Now it's uh, time to explain how they work and uh, what kind of decisions are given by the deep learning methods. And we are going to explore the reason uh, behind the models. Uh, so our speaker, uh, Ribana Rocher, I would like to thank you again for uh, uh, accepting our invitation for this great event. And I would like to also uh, talk about uh, her bio, a bit. reading from my phone. Ribana Rajar is a professor of data science for crop systems at University of Bonn and Germany and heads the same title group at the Institute of Bio and Geosciences at Research Center, Zurich, Germany. Until 2022, she was a junior professor of remote sensing with the University of Bonn. Before she was a postdoctoral researcher with the University of Bonn, the Julius Kuhn Institute, uh, Schweigander, Germany, Free Universität Berlin, Germany, and Humboldt Immun Innovation, Berlin, Germany. In 2015, she was a visiting researcher with the Fields Institute, Toronto, Canada, and 2018, uh, she was a visiting researcher with UCLA Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, Los Angeles, USA. Her research focus is pattern recognition and machine learning specif specifically for application in agricultural and environmental sciences. She currently chairs the IIPR Technical Committee 7 Remote Sensing and Mapping and the ISPRS Working Group Machine Learning for Geospatial Data. Thank you again. Now the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, for the introduction. And yes, uh, so in the next uh, two hours, a little bit more or less, let's see, I will tell you a bit uh, about explainable machine learning. That means I'm not telling you something new now about new models or how you can do semantic segmentation, but more how can you look into the networks? And so how can you really see how they work? If maybe it's especially good for uh, the people here who did not deal so much yet with uh, machine learning and with neural networks, because uh, I, I was uh, because this this is uh, an area which popped up uh, recently. It got uh, quite a hype uh, recently. Uh, I would have been happy to have such an area uh, many years earlier when all this uh, deep learning hype started, and uh, because. It will help, or I would talk uh, a lot about this reason, but uh, it will help you to find good models because a question very often appears, so w what kind of model should I use? What uh, is it good, what I learned? And I will give you some insights into this today. Uh, the topic is really, really big. I also have a YouTube lecture about this, uh, and I will give you today a few uh, parts of it here. And of course, I'm here the whole, uh, the whole week, so you can ask me questions all the time. So let's get started. Um, I mean, it's, it's good, that so Michael did a perfect start for me, he did, uh, the perfect basis, but uh, so what you're um, concerned with in uh, remote sensing is very often some of these questions. For example, so what is here, or what is the biomass in a specific area, or what would it look like next week? So it's classification, it's regression, it's forecasting. Um, but, uh, so all these kind of questions have a different level of complexity and difficulty, so forecasting is generally more difficult than um, classification. But this is not what I uh, want to tell you about. Uh, I want to tell you about other kind of questions. Uh, so we focus here on other kind of questions. For example, uh, why... Um, so why does, it, uh, why does it look like this? Or how did my algorithm come to a conclusion that this is water? Or why does my algorithm perform pulley here? And you can see 
These are how and why questions, and for the rest of the talk, I will exactly focus on these why and how questions. Um, and yeah, so um, what you what you can do is when you when you uh, approach a task like instance segmentation here. So you have an agricultural field, and you want to uh, segment, uh, for example, single plant. So you want to detect instances. And if you approach a task like uh, instance segmentation, you can use neural networks. They perform really good. They turned out to be, uh, or they, they proved already quite good. But these neural networks seem to be the prime example of black box models. So black box models means you cannot look into it uh, because they are too, too complex to be understandable. And to make deep neural networks more understandable and uh, to, um, yeah, to see what's going on and to answer these how and the why questions, uh, there are three core elements uh, we need, uh, that need to be considered. So one of the, or these three core elements are transparency, interpretability, and explainability. If you go to the literature, you will find different uh, terms and uh, beyond these, and sometimes these terms are mixed up. So I want to give you uh, a few, uh, on, on, or my view on these definitions, uh, which can help you to get, or to, to guide you through all this massive amount of literature which uh, popped up recently. Uh, the first one is transparency. So we very often talk about black box models, uh, but mostly we, as, uh, we, so mostly we have transparent models. So black box means you cannot look into it. Uh, the opposite is transparent models, but very often we have transparent models. Uh, and Michael already uh, told you this, you have a functional relationship between your input and the output. This is what you learn. So you have your parameters W, this is your input and this is the output. Um, so it's transparent. You, have, you can even write down the equation. So that's not the problem generally. The problem is mostly not the transparency, but it's more that the model is so complex that you cannot understand what's going on in there. And this is where interpretability comes into play. So interpretability is about um, making sense of the uh, obtained machine learning model. And uh, the goal is to present the properties of the machine learning model in a human understandable way. This can be, for example, uh, feature importance. So when you look at NDVI or when you look at the spectral channel, something like this, and you want to know what is the most important channel for my decision. Um, or you can look at uh, data points with a uh, special significance, such as archetypes or prototypes. So archetypes uh, are extreme points, prototypes are means or median of your data. Uh, the model parameters uh, is also one component, uh, and patterns in the model decision process. So what you do with uh, explainable machine learning is you look into the decision process of the neural network, and then you try to find what are consistent patterns in there, and maybe also outliers, or what's not working um, um, as, as usual. And the most prominent example for, um, for interpretability, uh, for, that means for uh, visualizing what's going on in the network, are heat maps. And he, uh, such a heat map you can see here, uh, or the multiple of this one. And they can be, for example, indicate in this example uh, why are these images identified as the same whale. Background story, so I'm not only working in remote sensing, I'm also working in environmental science, that's why you see in this talk also some close range applications, uh, like the, the, the crop type, or the, the crop mapping, or some whales. Um, but it doesn't matter, the, the, for the hands-on, yeah, we will do some uh, satellite image analysis. Okay, what you can see here, so these are whale flukes, and I will talk about this later a bit more. Uh, this is actually the same way, four images taken over a different time. And what heat maps do, they visualize uh, what was important for the decision. It means you have a corner in the image, which is in each image the same, and the network uh, identifies this as an important uh, pattern in there. Um, but there's even more, and I, I hope you listen carefully what I said, and I will um, tell you in a minute uh, what, what, why you should be careful. Uh, 
because there's even more, which is explainability. So explainability is known as XAI, explainable machine learning, intelligible intelligence, you name it, uh, a lot of these terms. Um, explainability is when you combine these interpretable entities such as heat maps with domain knowledge and in the best case an analysis goal. So what you need is actually it's an interpretation plus some knowledge you have. That's why it's important when you are interested in explainable machine learning, you want to do it, to get in contact with people who, who have knowledge about the domain. Uh, that's, and um, we just had a talk about this at the, at the lunch. Uh, it's, it's good to work interdisciplinary. So not only looking at the, um, at the methods, but also uh, always at the data and uh, yeah, the domain you're working in. It's helpful, especially for this year. And to make it more ex ex explicit, there's a, there's a difference between the interpretation and the explanation. So interpretability, as I said, is uh, when you present properties of a machine learning model in understandable terms to a human. And explainability is when you combine these interpretable entities with domain knowledge. The reason why we distinguish is um, uh, because an, an interpretation um, or the, the explanation can change depending on the added domain knowledge. So you can have one interpretation, but different explanation. And all these explanations can be correct. And that's the thing. Um, and I think it's an important step to go if you publish something uh, or encourage other researchers who work in this area to make it really explicit in their paper uh, if they only provide an interpretation, but also give explanation what is actually happening. So what was uh, going on in the model and how it can be explained. Um, yes, so um, there's uh, one important work I, I want to mention. And this is uh, the, the one from uh, Adadi and Barada, this year one. It's uh, for, I think, for uh, uh, AI already quite old, but I really like uh, this work. And it names to uh, four different reasons to seek explanation. This is also something I will focus or I will structure my talk a bit on. Um, so first of all, you can, um, you can say, uh, you can use explainable machine learning to justify decisions. So this is especially important when a decision is unexpected. I, I guess everybody of you already had this. You did something, you programmed something, and then something totally unexpected happened. And imagine you uh, go out and uh, you give your results to uh, some user. And of course, they also want to know uh, when, uh, yeah, is, is this correct or not. So it's important when the decision is unexpected, and if you know why a decision was made, you could justify it, uh, and you could justify that it's fair and that it's reasonable, something like this. It's, this is another term, uh, fairness. I do not want to talk about this here, but uh, also connected to this. So it can overall increase the trust. Then the second is you can enhance control. So explainability can help to, uh, to prevent that things go wrong. Uh, so if we can understand where the flaws of our model are uh, and how exactly a machine le uh, learning model works, um, uh, for example, uh, when we know more about uh, the weights and uh, how uh, specific uh, patterns in this model uh, appear, we have a better control over it, so you can um, you can even correct errors in the in the best case. And this is connected to the third one. If you know how your model works and when something goes wrong, you can improve it. And very often it happens that you sit there, it, uh, your model is not uh, really working, and you don't know if it's the data or if it's the model. And uh, but it's good to know because then if you know what what goes wrong, then you can also make a targeted improvement. Um, and the first one, uh, the, the last one, not the first one, uh, this is something I'm particularly interested in, is uh, you can discover new knowledge with it. Um, so this is, for example, when you uh, analyze the decision process of a machine learning model, it can tell you something more. So I will give you later an example about this. 
And uh, just to, to come back to the distinguish uh, interpretation and explanation, so here, for example, uh, for this year, an interpretation would be the score for the whale ID XY is significantly influenced by the image pattern in the right upper corner of an image. So is you're, is you're actually blind to the data, you just say what, what happened here. But the explanation is, uh, for example, when you have a whale expert or you know something about whales, the notch of, uh, in the fluke of the whale ID XY is a relevant fluke pattern for identifying the specific whale. And for this particular work, we actually worked together with a, a whale expert and uh, he so we needed one uh, who helped us with explanation. But also this is something I will tell you in a bit. Uh, another important thing be before I go to specific applications is uh, the connection to correlation causation. This is super important because there is a huge area out there with causal in France, causal machine learning. And they don't like us. They, 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 and they're somehow correct, uh, because uh, people working in explainable machine learning, they very often claim that they learn causal relationship, but it's not, that's not the case. So causation means that an output is the result of the occurrence of a specific input. So the input is the, uh, the cause and the output is the effect. Correlation uh, measures the relationship between the input and the output, but does not imply causation. So let me give you an example. It rains, that means plants will grow, and it will mean uh, that I will use an umbrella. But it does not mean when I use an umbrella that uh, plants will grow. But this is a correlation. This is something very often what we model in, uh, with machine learning. And that's totally fine, but we need to be aware of this, that we are not always doing this, but also sometimes doing this. Um, so it's, yeah. Machine learning is built on correlation, not, uh, not necessarily uh, causation. So when we connect this now to the area of explainable machine learning, we will also realize that these interpretation tools will build on correlation because we analyze machine learning models who build on correlation. And this is, um, so in this context, we really need to take care of the so-called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is our underlying tendency uh, to search for explanations which are in line with our existing knowledge. It happens. It happens to me all the time, and it happens, I guess it happens to you, because if you write a paper or anything else, you, you want to see good results. And this is, this is a bias, and uh, that can end up in a confirmation bias. So. Uh, we, ni we might tend to explain something uh, which we think we discovered in our data, uh, but it's actually not in the data or in the model. So this is all what I said. Nothing bad. It's all good, but we need to be aware what we do and uh, when we use explainable machine learning uh, that we do the right thing. So it's super cool. I still want to say this. Um, and let me show you a quite obvious uh, designed toy example uh, where an explanation would be wrong. Uh, because the model just captured a correlation in the data, uh, but it's really not a cause and effect. So, the, so what, would we, uh, what did we do here? So we trained a ResNet classifier for a scene classification. So scene classification means uh, one image in, one, la one label out, for example, school or beach. So we trained uh, with normal, one model with normal images and one where we manipulated the data. And the data was manipulated by adding the class of these uh, images on the, on the bottom and we learned also here a model. So, uh, and this is, um, I mean, it's obvious that this is not an important feature. We know this, the model doesn't know. If we provide the data in this specific way, uh, the, the model will pick it up as an important, um, uh, as an important feature. And this can be seen uh, when you change here the text to another label, very often the, uh, the classifier will be classified in an incorrect way. So, 
And this is, uh, becomes even more clear when we have a look uh, at the feature maps right before the decision layer. And here I already start with what we actually do in explainable machine learning, we look into the model. So uh, what you see here is uh, that when you uh, have, a, have a model, and uh, uh, Michael already told you something, there are these layers, and you have a specific output after each layer. And when you look into what the model has learned, such features, such pattern, right before the decision layer, you see they are high activation. So this seems to be very imp an, a very important feature for the model for the decision making. And that's not good. And this is uh, actually when you change the text, uh, the classification accuracy goes down. And this is a very prominent example, uh, or this is a prominent example of a so-called clever Hans effect. Clever Hans effect, um, that's a rather old story. Maybe you already heard about it. Um, there was a horse uh, called Clever Hans. And he, ha he had an owner, and the owner claimed that the horse is able to uh, do calculation, to do math. So what, what happened was there were wooden um, uh, signs with numbers on it, and then the owner told the horse, okay, uh, what is two plus one? And then he pointed to the, with the pl to the plates with the numbers, and the horse was intended to make a specific movement when the right um, answer was shown. And the horse did it. And uh, the audience was impressed, but in the end it turned out it was not because the horse can calculate, that was not the case. It was because the owner did a specific expression in his face. So the horse was looking at the wrong feature, but did the right decision. So clever Hans effect is when you have, when you do, or you come to the right decision, but based on the wrong reasons. So this is something um, where explainable machine learning can help you to identify uh, this and very helpful tool. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about approaches. Uh, so when you think about how a machine learning model could reveal insights into the decision process, you can uh, categorize it by specificity. Um, so the first one here on the top is when um, is, uh, is the explaining the output by the input. <clears throat> Um, and this is uh, when you want to understand how the model relates the input to the, uh, so how the model relates the input to the output. And in this case, you actually don't need to have uh, a transparent model here, so you can use a black, board, a black box model. Um, and this is so-called model agnostic. Model agnostic means you can uh, apply an approach and it works for. Any, uh, any or nearly any kind of model is not relying on this. Uh, so you just want to understand the mapping of the input of the output and what will happen to the output when you change the input. And the other one is uh, that you want to understand how specific parts in the network, um, yeah, how they work and how they are responsible for a specific uh, decision. So here you can uh, in, uh, find an interpretation, for example, uh, through methods that were uh, uh, tailored to specific methods. I will show you later, for example, approaches, uh, they do only work for convolutional neural networks. So they will analyze uh, what, what uh, filters were learned and how the convolutions, um, uh, or what they did in the model. And then you can uh, distinguish between uh, locality. So for the first one, you have a look at uh, a specific input data, so one single sample. Um, this can be quite interesting, for example, when you look at specific features in an image. And, but you can also explain globally. So you explain the whole data set, uh, um, so the entire model. And here, for example, uh, you can uh, define a pr uh, or you can um, optimized to a prototype, so you can manipulate a model uh, to get a maximum score. So you can ask the question, how should an image look like to get a maximum score out of it? So this will give you insights when your model, um, or what, what are typical patterns your model is waiting for. Um, yeah. So these are some categories, and in the last few years, so talk a bit, uh, a bit more about um, uh, what's going on in the research um, 
communities in the last few years, there were two prominent major research areas. So the, um, both give you insights into the decision process of the machine learning model, and uh, both work with model agnostic and model specific and with local and global um, methods. Um, and one is visualization, and the other one is attribution. So visualization is here you select, for example, um, so it answers the question, what does a model look for? And it selects, for example, representative samples, or, um, or it generates, for example, uh, examples that lead to high activation. That means um, what will lead to a maximum classification score. And the second one, attribution, is uh, here it answers the question which part of an example or an instance uh, or the data set is responsible for the model behaving in a particular way. And here, perfect example are heat maps. So it will guide you to uh, or point you to specific areas. So let's have a look more into this area here. And there are different types of attributions, and they all will answer you different kind of questions. Um, so what you, what you can see here is a model. Um, it can be a black, mo a black box model. That's why it's colored in black. And uh, so the, you have here some data instances and illustrated, um, so for example, this is one data instances and the numbers mean uh, some features in some areas, for example, in an image. And you can, for example, look at so-called feature attribution. So feature attribution, um, for example, looks at specific features like a specific type of a measurement. So very often this is also referred to feature importance. If you ever dealt with random forest, I guess you heard about feature importance. So this is, uh, yeah, SNM says, how important is one feature? Uh, and in case, um, or it's called feature importance in case you assume that the output uh, or that the change in the input when changing the, uh, the change in the output when changing the input is the importance of the features. This is also one, um, one important uh, point. So this can be done for single instances, but also for the whole data set. And there's a related term called feature selection. May, maybe you already heard about this. There's a difference between uh, the feature selection and the feature importance uh, analysis, uh, but sometimes they share similar techniques. The difference is that uh, feature selection is mostly applied before or during the model training, and uh, feature uh, attribution is, is uh, mainly applied during or after. That means post hoc. And feature selection is done very often manually, um, but the feature uh, attribution techniques for explainable machine learning involve very often some computations. So as, as, you, as for many areas in machine learning, there are connections and overlaps, and uh, it's always good to have a closer look into uh, what this actually means, and when you write something down, to be precise what you actually do. Okay, then another uh, one is pixel attribution. This is saliency mapping. So here you look at the importance of specific parts in an image. And this, for example, it is then highlighted in a heat map. So not only the features and so not the channels, but in an image in area, so more spatial uh, attribution. And then there's instance attribution. And this is when you identify important samples. So depending on what you want to do and what you want to reach and explain and find out about your data and your model, you need to find or you need to use some different things. So last slide on the, on the general things before we dive into the approaches. So this is, uh, it took me two minutes to collect some, uh, some terms and to, had, uh, to uh, build this uh, word cloud. And here you can already see you have sensitivity, you have relevance, you have saliency, contribution, and 
again, I, I guess I repeat myself, but if you work with explainable machine learning or even if you read papers, be careful. Sometimes in paper, they use a, a term and it's, it means something else. So uh, different um, authors will use the terms differently. That's not good. So I hope you will do it better. Um, yeah, just to mention a few, there are way more. Okay, so um, to give you a few examples, let's see how far we can go. But uh, up to now, you already know a lot and you're already prepared to dive uh, more into uh, this area. So what I want to show you is, first of all, we, um, yeah, these are the reasons to seek explanations. I want to show you a bit um, to enhance control, so how to actually look into a network. Uh, I will give you, or I will show these examples by an application I'm concerned with a lot, which is understanding wilderness on Earth, which is quite complicated. Uh, then I will show you some heat mapping um, with uh, way monitoring. Uh, here we do also some hands-on if we, if we have time. Um, but don't worry, I will give you the, the link and you can, you can also try it at home. And the last one is uh, to discover actually new knowledge. So not only enhance control and look into the network, but also can we get out of uh, what, we, what we actually do all the time? Can we gain new scientific knowledge? Um, yeah, I will skip this. This is just uh, what we do specifically, but let's dive into it. So first of all, how can we look into a neural network? And so we want to visualize what was learned. So what is illustrated here uh, is, yeah, a neural network. And very often you see this visualization with these blocks. And as uh, Michael already said, a neural network is nothing else than a chain of mathematical operations. So it's one operation after each other, nested. Uh, and what one block illustrates is uh, our so-called activation maps. And the activation maps are the outcome after applying one or several mathematical operations. And uh, this is a new representation. This is something, I guess you already heard about representation learning. So neural networks are not a classifier or a regressor or something else. Of course, they can be. But what they actually do is they take the data, then they learn a new representation. And this representation is learned with respect to an analysis goal, which is the loss function. So uh, the representation is especially useful for classifying or for, uh, for regression, but it, it can be also used to analyze uh, the, the representation or even the representation alone can sometimes be really good. Um, so for example, I work in the area of pattern recognition. Finding patterns is already interesting en enough. You don't not always need a classification or a regression. It can already tell you a lot. Okay. But what can actually be visualized? So on the one side, we can uh, visualize the intermediate activation, so the outcome after each of these blocks. And uh, it, it simply, yeah, simply plot what the operation has uh, produced. And you can also look at the weights and the filters. So when very often um, we use convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks are really good in extracting spatial patterns. And uh, these convolutional filters can be visualized. And they will tell you something what the, uh, what the network, um, yeah, what the network has learned of important uh, patterns, but in a quite complicated way. I, I, will, I would show you a few images and I will let you decide if you think this is a good visualization or this helps you to understand th something or more like this here. From my perspective, uh, I think activation are much easier to study than weights. I think this is also why so much work uh, are looking on the activations and not so much on the weights. Okay, let's go back. Um, I want to put the focus again of such a block. So what can you look now uh, in this block? 
So if we illustrate this block or this cube in more detail, it would actually look like this. And uh, so each cell in this cube is a single activation, uh, so an output in, in these activation maps. And these two directions correspond to the positions in the image. And this direction uh, is the channel. So for example, if you apply a one-dimensional convolutional filter to a one-dimensional image, uh, you get, you get um, you know, if you apply four one-dimensional filters to a one-dimensional input, uh, you get four one-dimensional activation maps. So you have four, um, four of these filters, and you apply it to your input, you get four outputs. We will get also to, for the hands-on, it gets more clear. And then, for example, we can have other illustrations depending on what you, what you want to do. For example, you can have the spatial activation. So here you look uh, over all channels, over all convolutional filters, or you can look at the whole activation maps. This is something very helpful. And then, um, let's dive a bit deeper into what is actually used for visualization, how you can gain insights. So, as I said already, the smallest unit is these activations. They can be found in, in all layers. And, um, for example, in a convolutional neural network, this would be an output of a, of a convolution of an image patch and a filter both of the same size. So, and then we can have a look at the channels. So here, for example. This is one channel in uh, one uh, layer. It's also called the activation map. Or you can have a look at the whole layer output. And this is something, for example, uh, used for, um, for some, or quite some uh, approaches. But we will have a look at this here specifically. Maybe that's better. Yeah. Better? Yeah. Okay, we will have the box back later. Yeah. After the yeah. two hours. Okay. Okay, perfect. Good. Some secret arrangements. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, where did I stop? Ah, yeah. We will have a look at this here, but also. Looking at this specific part here is also really in, uh, interesting. For example, um, when uh, um, uh, here, when you look at the raw scores immediately before uh, the, uh, the decision uh, output, you can, for example, think about, okay, what, uh, or if, uh, by analyzing these activations here, you can uh, learn prototypes or uh, what or manipulate in the network or the input in a way that it will cause a maximum output. That would be not possible if you have a look at this here or try to manipulate the uh, neural network in this way. So it depends what you want to do, but we, you will see. Okay, so uh, one application I already teased a bit is the uh, wilderness uh, detection. The problem is at the moment uh, that we do not have a technical de definition of what wilderness is on Earth. That's why we cannot map it, but it would be actually interesting to know how much wild areas and natural areas we have on Earth, especially when you think about the pandemic, because we know um, that such areas prevent the spread, so it would be good to know, to map them. But at the moment, we cannot do it because no technical definition, um, so we cannot use it for machine learning. And what we actually want to do with um, explainable machine learning is we want to discover characteristics of wilderness. Okay, so what we did is, and this is also for the hands-on, what uh, data you will use is uh, we have we identified a study site in Finnuskandia. Finnuskandia is Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And then we extracted training data. So training data is we thought about, we do not really know what wilderness is, but we can tell what it's uh, when um, what is especially very very wild or what is especially anthropogenic. 
so the opposite of it. The extremes are very often easy for us to, uh, to define. What is hard is everything in the middle. So what we did is we uh, had a look at the World Database on Protected Areas, the WDPA, and anthropogenic areas. So this is something in Fenoscandia, really remote areas, and uh, we would all agree that's a quite wild area. And anthropogenic areas here, artificial and agricultural surfaces, we all would agree that's not wild, not natural. And then what we did is uh, we extracted Sentinel-2 uh, data. Um, so here you can see anthropogenic uh, Sentinel-2 images and protected areas. And uh, our first thought when we um, thought about, okay, what is white and what is not white? Yeah, white areas are green. And then we saw this and thought, okay, no. Uh, so it's, this is also very green. And we have a lot of forest close to, uh, yeah, urban area, so obviously not so easy, and it's, it's really not easy. Uh, and here you can see uh, the distribution of tr uh, the training data and the validation and the test data, but it's not so important about this because you will get uh, a totally nicely prepared data set uh, you can work with which contains these patches, uh, 256 times 256, um, two data patches with one label, anthropogenic um, or protected. And then something special. Today, uh, we focus on one specific network. And this uh, one specific network is especially useful for explainable machine learning, and we named it JungleNet. There's a U-net in it because it contains a unit. And we use it for wilderness, so we named it jungle net. So just to cover it a bit, uh, good to remember. Um, so our network, it, what we designed is a combination of a unit and uh, some kind of decision network. And in the end, we get out of it one wilderness fraction. So it's not a classification framework, it's a regression network. And to go in a bit into more detail, so this is the network with all its components and sizes. Um, so the conceptual framework is the following. So we have one multispectral Sentinel-2 image, then we feed it into the first part, which is a unit. It's called unit because it has specific, or the paper that proposed it has uh, printed it as a U, that's why it's called unit. Uh, the important thing is that here is a bottleneck and in the end the, the size of the output is as big as the input from the height and the width. This is an important thing. And this part here is uh, a decision network. So what it does, it applies several convolutions, and in the end, it has uh, one, uh, yeah, from uh, some some uh, fully connected connections in there. And so, what is this wilderness fraction? As I said, we were good in defining the extremes, but nothing in between. So we could not collect data where we could say, okay, this is to 80% wired or to 60% wired. But what, so what we did is we applied a technique called cut mix. Michael already uh, told you about some specific uh, techniques that you can crop something out of images or the training data, you can play with it. We use cut mix, and cut mix is when you have um, an, an image and you just cut a part out of it and one part, for example, 80% of the original patch was, is then uh, anthropogenic and 20% is fr we take from um, an image patch which is wilderness. And so the, the wilderness fraction is two, uh, 0 0.2. So we designed our data, not really synthetic, but uh, so we get this, um, this wilderness fraction. This, is, this was helpful because the classification did not really let us have a look into the network or it did not reveal any insights. And one important thing you will see here is uh, these activation maps, which is the output of the unit. And here we will later look at um, yeah, what, what, what they, they actually uh, tell us or we can analyze it in more detail. Okay, but as promised, uh, 
let's have a look first at the weights and later acti uh, at the activations. So this is what you, if you visualize the convolutional filters in the first layer. And I don't know how about you, but uh, I mean, maybe you can see sometimes, yeah, maybe here's uh, some kind of edge or an important pattern, maybe here, who knows. And you can even go more through the network in layer four. For me, it looks the same, or even, even deeper when you visualize it, but doesn't really tell something. So it's not that it helps you to visualize the, the weights. Why is it so? Uh, the thing is, um, first of all, in the first layer, so the first layer, we can visualize the weights uh, because they are linked to RGB values. So we have the input, RGB or multispectral, and then the first filters, they are connected. So you can still make some sense out of it, but all the deeper, um, uh, operations in there, the convolutional filters are uh, a result from convolutions before. And this is something so complex we cannot really make sense out of it. And then there's a, um, a problem of these indirect interactions. So not, sometimes uh, there are meaningful and imp important weight interactions in the network. Uh, between neurons that are not immediately connected. Sometimes you have skipped connections or you have other, uh, some operations in this network. And so, but this is nothing you can really visualize. So it will not help you to get really insights into it. Sometimes it's nice to, to have it, but does not really help. And now uh, let's have a look at the activation. Looks better. Right, so it's uh, you can you can see more uh, how to what to what to do with it. I will um, tell you later, but uh, this is actually the first hands-on I will show you. Uh, so this is the original images, uh, and this is the output from a shallow layer, from a bottleneck layer, and from a deep layer from the jungle net. And to give you some hands-on or to show you how to actually do it. Uh, first I stop, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, before the hands-on, I would like to uh, talk about the secret arrangement that we made. Uh, we are not going to give a coffee break. Uh, until 4 o'clock, Rubana is going to talk about uh, the explainable AI, and after that, we're going to give the coffee break, and uh, at uh, 4.30, we're going to uh, have a, a short trip uh, to ancient city, okay? Thanks. Okay. Secret. <laughs> no, not so secret. But I, I think it's better because I would take for two hours, even if I stop afterwards, it's fine. You can, uh, I mean, you get the slides and... The important things I already said. Okay, so um, I think for the uh, interest of time, so this is uh, the, the um, ah, no, I did not show the, uh, the link again. Sorry. Um, so, that's, that's fine for now. So if you want to uh, have it, do it at the same time. It's not, it's not a lot, but uh, you can play around. Um, so what I, what I will show you is how you can get to these activations and how you can visualize it. This whole thing is based on the GitLab, uh, which was set up by my uh, PhD student, Timo Stromberg, and it's, it's a lot. So I just pick a very tiny uh, thing out of it. Uh, if you go later to, um, you, can, you can have an even deeper look into it. Okay. So what will happen here? So first of all, uh, so this is the, the, uh, the code. Uh, this is what you need to install. That's correct, right? Yeah. 
Right, so what, what it does, it, it's in play, uh, it installs a huge package which contains a lot of useful tools including the, the jungle net and later also the weights and um, everything what is needed. Yeah. Okay. So let's wait how that it installs everything. Okay, I think that's fine, but so what you need is, uh, actually uh, Michael already mentioned it, what you need is to load out some libraries, for example, such as uh, Torch. What we need later is especially uh, the tanh function, uh, which is an activation function in the neural network. So what you need to do as next is you in, uh, import the libraries, and then, I prepared some, um, some, uh, oh, not yet. Uh, I prepared some data uh, for you and also the model. So you, what you need to do is you need to um, download the weights because we are not here to train this network. It takes a long time. We are here to analyze, so we pre-trained it and everything is fine. You get a really high uh, accuracy, everything is good. So what you need to do is you need to load um, the model. So this is actually all preparation things. So you can just assume that everything is okay, fine. And here's, I prepared some images. So this is uh, that the data will be loaded. And here, yeah, I prepared three images, three different ones, and this part here is, so these are the three images. You can decide on one of them. You can also use another one. So if you go to the website, to this GitHub, you can also download the data set. So the whole data set is publicly available. You can work with it. You can do whatever you want. Um, print it out. It's really nice, actually. Uh, and what we do is we visualize the data, and since we have a lot, uh, since we have large satellite images, and we cannot really work with these large satellite image, we crop um, one part out of it. And this part is uh, 256 times 256. This is all uh, what the network was trained on. And to show you, um, it's really hard to do it with the microphone in one hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what you see here, so this is, this is one image, the big one, and here on the top, uh, on the bottom is this patch crop, right? So this is what we work with now. So as I said, first of all, you have the jungle net and you need to set it up. What you need to do for it? First of all, you, uh, some, some parameters you set, you have 10 channels, uh, you have an image size of 256 times 256. The number of unit maps is the number of uh, maps after the unit we, you want to visualize. It's uh, three turned out to be really good. Very convenient, but also two is fine, four is fine, but three turned out to be uh, a really good. Uh, number for analysis. The number of targets is one because we have a regression network. Um, this is some uh, some things, uh, some internal things, not so important for now. And what we do with this is we actually load the weights. So here you can see the number of parameters in the unit. It's initialized, so you can also download the weights for. Uh, of course, it's all. Um, it's all on the website. And then, uh, this is some computational thing. I think I did not select the 
what Michael told you about the, the, the GPU use, I did not do it, but it's not so important for now. Please, please do it no normally. I refer to Michael. <laughs> so, okay, that's the important part now. After all this uh, preparation thing, what we do is we now make a prediction with the unit, not with the whole jungle net, but only with the unit part. And then it's visualized because you have three different uh, units, channels. You get also three of these maps, and we visualize that to make it a bit more, uh, con more convenient as red, green, and blue. And you can already see that there are some patterns. Remember here, for example, there was a lake, uh, here was some, some forest structures, here was some, yeah, some, um, uh, some men, man-made structures and so on. But this is something, okay, it looks interesting, but not so, will not help you so much. Um, what is, for example, better is when you visualize these as RGB. So what does it tell you? So remember when I said a neural network is a representation learner, so it will help you to extract important characteristic, unique patterns. And what you can see here is all these uh, that in areas uh, that have the same color, they share same patterns. The thing is when you, for example, I, I would ask you and to tell you what is an important pattern of a lake or of a forest. It's really difficult, but we can use neural network to find these patterns for us and to visualize them. So th they're, they're good in, in doing this. And what you can tell then is, okay, all these areas share the same pattern. Here are the same patterns and these blue areas share the same patterns because these are areas which have the same activation. Same activation means they share the same decision process in the neural network. Right, so these are the unit activations. Uh, then uh, what you can also do is uh, you can set, uh, you can use so-called hooks. A hook is when you want to have a look into a specific layer in the network, in a specific activation map. Because this is it's nothing um, that you can just go there and grab it out. You need to put in some effort. And this is actually what is done here. So a hook is used, as the name says, as a hook, and it, it stores the actual intermediate activation so that you can uh, later uh, assess it and then visualize it. So you can have a look in, in more detail to it. To it. Um, but just to show you, for example, here you can uh, use uh, the dimension of the activation map so then, uh, the, the actual number of the activation map, and if it's done in uh, the encoder and the decoder, this can be changed. Um, this better. This can be changed here. So now it's in the second encoder layer, but you can also change it to uh, a decoder, for example, and have a look there. And that's it, for example. So here is the, the, the 16th activation dimension, so the 16th activation map in uh, the second encoder layer. And it looks good. It looks good because you can uh, see the initial structures. And for example, um, due to the time, please uh, uh, try it out later. So what you can, for example, see is when you go in deeper layers, uh, also, the dimension would change. So it's a unit, it gets smaller. That means also the activation map gets smaller and they need to be upsampled again. So it's not that you have a nice uh, image anymore, but uh, very, very coarse structures. But in the end, um, yeah, each of these uh, layers can tell you something. Okay, so this is the... Um, down, this one. My Italian is really not good. Perfect.
So this is all what I showed you. Ah, yeah, this is what I forgot. Please do it. I forgot it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a bit more explanation. OK, so this is the what you just saw. So early layers for a, f a focus of what you see when you have a look at different um, of these uh, of these features, so that you uh, earlier layer focus on the general features and later layer uh, later on more complex. The thing is, why why is it so? Um, because you always learn a neural network with an intention. So, for example, when the analysis goal is a classification, your neural network will give you important features for the classification. This is something important. So, for example, if you um, want to classify crop types, crops have a nice phenological cycle, yeah? And when you, but when you do a classification task and you look for example as grass and, and crops and some potatoes whatever, whatever what is learned in the network always focus on the discriminative features not on the generative features the, the, the features which describe the class only the features which are important for the discrimination and this is something what is forgotten very often what is done recently very often is uh, looking at the tensions Attention will you can you can visualize attention and see what is um, yeah important the network is looking for, but it's used for classification, so you cannot really describe a class with it. What is important for this specific class, you always need to explain it in the context of all the other classes used in your classification framework. It's an important thing. Good, so let's come back. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit more what you can actually do more with it uh, than the actual visualization. The data set you can use and download is uh, we have more than 19,000 of these training samples. And all these training samples belong to either wilderness or anthropogenic areas. When we now extract all these RGB uh, or this unit uh, activation maps three-dimensional here you get something like this and you can yeah you can already see okay these are anthropogenic areas they turn out to be more bluish then you have uh, water bodies they are more purple so you already see there's some some pattern in it and if you now because they are three-dimensional, if you take all these values and put it in a coordinate system, the so-called activation space, you get something like this. And this is already quite interesting because it looks, does not look like an exploded pillow or all these activations are not everywhere. They already have some, some structure in it. And so this already tells you how variable, for example, the activations are, or if we have specific clusters. Um, this might be, for example, good for classification. And in, in the end, it already gives you a good impression on how distinctive the patterns of the objects and the images uh, and these areas are. And now you can do something interesting. You can connect it to other kind of data, for example, um, Micah, I think you already mentioned this uh, Korean land cover data set or some kind of global, uh, globally freely available uh, land cover data set. Um, yeah, it's called Korean and you can connect all these together. So you have the, the satellite image, the activation maps, and this is one part exactly for this year for the Korean uh, land cover data set. So Korean Land cover data set is for the whole for whole Europe. It has a ground resolution of 100 meters, so not too detailed, but and 44 classes. And by connecting now uh, this activation space I told you before, you can connect this to uh, this land cover classification data set. And that's interesting because we never learned any segmentation. We had one image, 
wilderness and non-wilderness, and now we can connect it, for example, okay, this whole area are water bodies. So obviously, water bodies share similar patterns. And, or that, for example, arable land obviously has a lot of different patterns. So it's not, our purpose was not classification or something like this, it was more like, what are actually typical patterns uh, from another data set we already familiar with, uh, how can we connect it to wilderness and learn something about wilderness? Um, there also, it's not only wilderness, there are also other classes, for example, scenicness or something like this. Uh, we have no idea about it, but we maybe like to know more about it. You can also do it with text. Very, very hot topic also at the moment, so you can uh, learn embeddings of text and connect it to activation, something like this. Just to, just to give you an uh, impression, I will later go even one step further, but uh, just an intermediate um, thing, what I want to show you is to justify decisions. Because uh, it's a different topic, but I think I, I want to show you at least one, uh, uh, one example of this heat mapping. Because this is the, the general, usual, most commonly used explainable machine learning technique. And so keep everything in mind, what I told you, and we will continue later. So, uh, yeah. Going from wilderness to Wales, so a bit more close range, and thinking about how can we actually have a look into, or how can we justify the decisions of our network? So now we really want, we learn something and want to justify it. So whale monitoring um, is something I guess you all are aware that whale monitoring is important because um, the population is threatened by commercial whaling and uh, ocean warming and competition for food. So what, um, what is normally done is there are photos taken very often by tourists and the fluke is very unique for a whale. So if you take photographs of a fluke and you have some specific features and you can identify them, you can identify or can re-identify whales all over the world. And then, for example, um, yeah, uh, getting insights into how, how far they uh, went or if they are still there and such things. So important are uh, color patterns, for example, or this uh, notch or the fluke uh, corner, something like this. There was a Kaggle challenge a few years ago, and it's not surprising uh, that neural networks were the winner. All three winning solutions for neural networks. What, what was done is they were, um, uh, several, they had several thousands of whale images, fluke images, and they are to be assigned with only a few pictures. So per whale you had maybe two, three, five images, not more. And you have uh, more than 5,000 classes, so different whale IDs. And so the research question you can identify now is why does the network identify images as the same whale? And is a whale expert looking at the same area in the, in, uh, in the image as the network. The reason why we want to find this out is first of all, we are researchers, so we were just interested in this. Is the network really does the same as we do? Because this is uh, claimed all the time. Um, and then we can, if, if it's the case, we can exploit our domain knowledge in a, in a much better way. Be, for example, if we know that uh, scars disappear over the years, it's not a good feature if you want to track whales over the years. So it should not, the network should not put the focus on the scars. So that's, that's good uh, when we connect the domain knowledge with the network. And to give you one very simple method, um, or actually we implemented two different methods to see what, uh, um, yeah, what, uh, or what, is, what are the important, um, or what is important for the decision making of the network? One are occlusion sensitivity maps. The occlusion sensitivity maps are illustrated here, the principle. So the goal is to, uh, as the name says, to evaluate the sensitivity of the trained model to occlusions by calculating the difference 
between the original score and the score after applying occlusions. So this is the fixed model. Uh, this is what you learn for the whale identification. Here you have the whale IDs. One ID is one specific whale. And here you have um, the original image, and for this you get a specific score. That means a classification score. And then you cover up a specific part of the image, and you will get a different score. And the difference is actually illustrated in this heat map. Very simple, um, and this already gives you um, what, what is important or what is uh, actually uh, the network relying on in the images. And what you can see here are green values and purple values. This is also one thing. If you see a heat map, it does not necessarily mean that every time the colors mean the same. So it's good to find this out before. Um, for this study, we actually thought it's a good idea to, to change it to green and purple because it was easier to visualize, but it's not really in line with uh, how everybody else did it. But so don't be confused. <laughs> um, so green means the score decreases. That means the regions are an indicator for a specific whale. So if you cover it up, the score goes down. Obviously, it was uh, important. And then purple values. Uh, here means you cover something up and the score increases. This is always a very difficult thing to do. And very often, this is just left out in papers or even when we think about uh, what to do because um, it can mean that uh, regions are an indicator for other whales or not a specific whale. It depends on the loss function. If you have a softmax function, uh, so the score will automatically go to the other classes. So it's um, advice, focus on what you really want to explain and what you are really interested in. Have a look at the other things. If it's confusing, leave it away. It's good to show, but it's, it's just um, not really meaningful what's, uh, what's coming out. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it just, can just be confusing for the reader. And then uh, there are different types of occlusions. So for example, you can use a patch. And this is what is uh, done most commonly um, with uh, yeah, some value, white, black, whatever. Um, then what is a bit more sophisticated is that you take the mean value patch, so the mean of the whole uh, image or the whole data set. That's better. Uh, or you can just do a Gaussian blurring. Uh, or you can use segments. But here, of course, the method is not so easy. Before, you had the sliding window approach, very nice. Here, you need to think a bit more about it. Um, the thing is that here I can already tell, uh, or I will tell you some, some disadvantages later. Um, just to give you now I, uh, the, the results of the occlusion sensitivity maps, for this, remember, same whale. And it obviously focuses on these uh, fluke edges, these white patterns here in all images. And when we asked uh, the whale expert, he said, yes, that uh, would be a pattern that's uh, important. But what is interesting is such uh, interpretation methods normally look only at one of these important features. Whale experts normally look at two to three. So they always want to ensure um, that it's correct. But it was uh, a nice result. Yeah, advantages and disadvantages, something you need to be aware of. It's simple and versatile. Personally, I have really good experience with occlusion sensitivity maps. We use it uh, all the time just as a quick check, and it's just interesting to see uh, if the model does what you want. But uh, what is challenging is the definition of the patch, the occlusion patch. Um, because the patch is agnostic uh, to semantic segments which can differ in size. So sometimes you have this small notch in the, in the fluke whale, but you have these big white patterns. So how, what, is the, what is a good size? So that's the first challenge. Then every occlusion is a signal. So it's not that you can delete something. So it's a, it's a signal, so you need to think about what signal is not significant. Um, so to just to, yeah, to give too much new information into the network. 
And that's why the Gaussian blurring is a quite good compromise. It just uh, blur the important features. And then there's a distribution shift. This is something crucial. So the patch might be out of distribution. The thing is, if you cover an image up, this, um, uh, this whole uh, the, the, the network is not prepared for such an image because it, it did never learn uh, whale images with, pa with patches in it. So if you plot the whole whale fluke distribution, your images with patches might be somewhere else in this feature space. That means the classification of the network might be not reliable, but you need a reliable network to get actually a good difference between the scores. That's that's a challenge. It's good to know about it. Um, it can be bad. It can be not so bad. You need to try it out. Uh, and it's computationally expensive. That's because it's a sliding window approach. Uh, we have a hands-on if we, if we have time for it later. Otherwise, you can test it. You need to be patient <laughs> when you click the button for the occlusion sensitivity map. And um, yeah, so then one thing I want to mention it. So now you can you analyze single images, but you can also analyze uh, the the whole data set. So the whole set of um, uh, or the, the whole decision process, not only the a single image. And this is um, done by uh, by clustering heat maps. So. Imagine you have a lot of training images or tes testing images, that's even better, testing images. Then you have heat maps belonging to each of these images. And then you can apply a clustering algorithm. Um, and what, what it does, it, it clusters actually patterns in the decision process because the decision process is reflected in the heat maps. Um, and let me show you how we've done this. Uh, one, one thing is spectre clustering. If you don't know spectre clustering, it's a really cool tool. It's uh, a, a clustering technique based on eigenvalue decomposition. What you do is you, uh, class, uh, you, you vectorize all your heat maps or images, and then uh, you, um, uh, you, you, uh, you compute the distances between all the images, what you have, and then you do an eigenvalue decomposition. These, uh, and then you cluster based on the, the eigenvectors. The thing is, if you cluster on the, uh, on the eigenvectors, it will, it's able to cluster on really highly uh, complicated manifolds in high dimension space. So it's a nonlinear clustering technique. You can have a look into it. If you have complicated data and you want to cluster it, I can recommend to have a short look into spectral clustering. Okay, so um, just to give you some uh, examples, so this is, for example, heat maps of cluster one, heat maps of cluster two, and of 29. What you can see here, here the whole fluke is important. We think it's because of the shape. Uh, here you have specific uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the outer sides of the fluke, and this is collection of anything else, <laughs> something not so really important. And one thing what we do is uh, we went even one step further. So what we did is we related the detection rate to the heat maps. Because uh, you can learn something or you can even get another, uh, another kind of uncertainty score, how reliable your model is. So how to do this? Um, so we computed how many of the heat maps belong to the correct decision. So what, do you, what, do you, what we do is, uh, or what we did, we had a lot of these heat maps, and when we connected it to the, uh, the prediction or the classification score, pred top one prediction means um, you always have a ranking of the score. If the highest score was the correct class, top two prediction uh, means uh, that the second highest score was the correct uh, classification, and so on. And then we plotted here the cluster number uh, versus the number of correct assignments. So, and the clusters are sorted um, by the number of correct assigned whales. And what you can see here, there are obviously one or two clusters where most of the heat maps belong to top one prediction. What does it mean? 
when you have now a new test image, uh, you don't know, uh, you have a score, you classify it, and you don't know how reliable the result is, you can see if the heat map of this test result or this test image uh, falls in one of these clusters, and then you have an additional um, kind of uh, um, yeah, reliability score. So you can assume that these are good clusters. Um, here, most heat maps belong to wrong prediction, and here you have some clusters. They did not contain a lot of these heat maps, but they are very likely wrong. And it's interesting to see that um, the, you can also have a look at the softmax score to get some kind of reliability, but they are not always on the same page. So they, they, they do tell some, sometimes something different. And it's interesting to have a look at this. OK, so um, this is what I, what I said, what we learned from it. And uh, then I want to give you, I have half an hour left, right? OK, OK, OK. Huh? I'm here also the whole week, so you can ask me. And now I'm just thinking what I tell, because I will not uh, do everything, but uh, let me t give you a brief impression uh, to uh, what you can else do. Uh, so. When we have a look at the categorization again, right? Uh, this is the occlusion sensitivity map. So you were shaking a bit the input, and then you see what, how the output changes, sensitivity. Let's, I want to briefly show you one, um, one model, which is specific, or one approach which is specific for a specific network architecture, namely convolutional neural networks. Not super specific, but specific. And um, so what, you, what, you, uh, what I now present to you is some, uh, one of the methods which use so-called uh, backward, backward propagation passes. So you're not using a change in the input, but you're using the gradients in the network. Um, just um, if you did not optimize a network yet, uh, so backpropagation is how you optimize the, the loss function, how you uh, get to all the good ways so that your network is working properly. So imagine it, uh, the gradients are just when you, when you change something in the network uh, and how the output changes, this is reflected by the gradient. And this can be also used for explainable machine learning in, as you see, different ways. Maybe you already heard about the deconf nets or the layer-wise relevance propagation. I also added all the time um, here the references, so you can look them up. They are all seminal papers, not specific papers, but the seminal papers for these um, approaches. Okay, so when I talk, yeah, as I already said, when I talk about gradient-based saliency maps, uh, they use the gradients. And this is illustrated, for example, here. So this is the output, f from x, and you can uh, take the derivative to a specific, um, yeah, specific uh, multidimensional pixel x. Uh, B are the channels. Um, this is uh, the a specific um, arbitrary norm. Um, for example, the maximum norm. So we are working with gradients. I do not want to go into details. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I, there are really good tutorials on YouTube, for example, about back propagation. Yeah, but we work with gradients now. Okay, so uh, a method that was specifically designed for convolutional neural networks are class activation maps. And so class activation maps, they indicate the discriminative regions used by CNNs for classification. So no gradients yet, but they will come. So what is done is, uh, for example, we look at a simple convolutional network as is illustrated here. So we have some convolutional uh, blocks, then we flatten it, that means we vectorize it. And then you have a cool, fully connected uh, layer with a decision layer so that you can get to a specific class. Typical structure, you find it all the time. 
So, um, when we want to compute, uh, compute class activation maps, we replace the flattening, flattening layer here now with uh, a global average pooling. Global average pooling is nothing else than summing. So you have a layer, you have activations, and you, you sum over all the activations. So global, um, yeah, uh, it's um, global average pooling here. This is, um, yeah, this part here is replaced now with this here. Uh, what it does, it first sums over all these activations in each. So this is one activation uh, map. It, it sums over all the activation in each map and then it concatenates them. So if you have, for example, 10 activation maps, you now have a vector with 10 elements, nothing else than the sum. And then a weighted sum of this vector is uh, fed into the final softmax layer or any decision layer you want. So, and the important thing is here, you get such weights from it. And these weights are now used as a, as a weight for the activation maps. And if you have these weighted summing of the activation maps, you actually get such a heat map. And this is, uh, that was a really nice work, um, but as I said, no gradients yet. It has had some disadvantages because it needed this specific architecture and nothing else. It only worked with this architecture, but maybe you wanted to do something else because this is suboptimal for your task. Um, so then there was an extension, it's called GradCam, and as the name said, it's a class activation map, but now with gradients. So it's an extension which uh, weights the activation maps based on the gradient. So it's not, uh, not only this anymore, but now we use the gradients for the weighting. Um, so it's more versatile since it produces a visual explanation for any arbitrary convolutional neural network. Um, so again, we look, uh, we look uh, here at the network with multiple, with multiple layers and we have a look at a specific um, convolutional layer and the output of it, so the activation maps. What you normally do is you use the very last one because the very last one has the most complex information. It will give you not only edges or something, and it's in the, in the first layers, but yeah, it turned out it's a good choice to have the very last uh, um, layer. Okay, so I will go through it step by step. So first of all, what you do is, um, yeah, you forward propagate the input image for your network, it's fixed. Again, you do nothing else, it's already trained. And, uh, and you obtain the raw score from the class of interest just before applying the softmax sigmoid. That's also important. Do not use the softmax or the sigmoid output, but the score, the raw score before it, because then it's not normalized. You will lose a lot of information if you uh, would use the softmax output. And then you decide on a class you are interested in. It's called class activation map, so you focus on one specific class. And you set all the other scores to zero. And then, um, ah yeah, this is the overall equation. Not very complex, and I will go through every step with you. So this is um, the very first thing. You get the output. This is the output for a specific class K. In the next step, you do the back propagation. So you compute the gradient. This is actually what you see here. So you decided on, uh, you want to analyze this specific um, layer and you want to have a look what was learned from it, what was learned there. So you back propagate the gradient of the raw score here, start from here, of a specific class. That means in our case, a specific whale ID. And you back propagate it to the convolutional layer you're interested in. These are the gradients. So RC is the, the row and the, uh, the column, and J is the number of the activation map. So then you perform a global average pooling. That means, um, yeah, the gradients are averaged across the activation maps. So this is, you can understand this as the importance of each activation map for the target class. If you have a lot of high activations, that's a high value, so it gets a high weight afterwards. 
And then you average all the activation maps, so you have a lot of them, but you want to one output because you analyze the whole, the whole layer, not only a single activation map anymore. Um, and in the end, you perform relu. Relu is just you cut off all negative values because you're only interested in the contribution to this class. Yeah, and this is, this is the output. Um, so this line here. So you, again, you have these four specific whales. This was the result from the occlusion sensitivity maps, and this is the result from GradCam. So in GradCam, uh, we analyzed only, that's only one convolutional, uh, or one of these layers. It looks at this notch, and that was interesting because it's very, very typical for the specific whale. Um, but it was also interesting that occlusion sensitivity map gives you different results. This is also one thing, I do not have time to talk about it, but is, um, it's actually called Rashomon effect. So when you have um, a lot of good results, but they all give you uh, different things, but they're all good. So you somehow you need to bring them together. So it's good to have to test a lot of explanation, interpretation methods, not only one. This is my advice to, to give you. And again, um, when, we, uh, when we talk to the, um, uh, to the way expert, Ted Cheeseman, he lives in California. I think it's a really nice life, <laughs> too. He's the, he does uh, whale watching and works with researchers. And uh, yeah, uh, he said, yeah, he would look also at the notch, but focus on more than one. It would be interesting uh, to maybe look at different layers, maybe then there are more of them. OK, so. Um, I think, okay, what do you prefer? <laughs> do you want to see the hands-on with the occlusion sensitivity map and the grad cam? Or do you, we try it. I think we, we have time, we have time. We, we can do it, we can do it. Okay, so. It's the same notebook. Everything is uh, already there. And what we do now is it's actually not a lot of code. So this is the code for GradCam. Very easy. Because there's a library called Captum. I can highly recommend it. Go to Captum AI. They have a lot of pre-implemented um, Interpretation methods, occlusion sensitivity map, uh, gradients, everything. Super cool. Uh, my students work with it all the time, and it just uh, gives you, you don't need to care about how actually everything is implemented in an efficient way. It's good to understand what the interpretation methods do, but yeah, just install it, and uh, it's, it's really helpful for working with it. Um, also, the documentation is quite nice because it also gives you uh, quite some um, um, examples how to apply them, which I think is always very useful. Um, then you import something what is needed, for example, for the for GradCam, and if you apply it now to the image we used before. Uh, you can get some results. Okay, so what do you see here? First of all, um, what is happening? You, this is um, our one image, so a batch of uh, size one, our one image. And then you can decide which kind of layer do you want to analyze. Decoding layer, encoding layer, as I said, very often the very last uh, layer is good. Here, for example, the fourth decoding layer is the very last before the unit. You could even go further in the... Um, ah, yeah, this is one thing. So we, we split our model in the impl implementation in the jungle net into unit and scorer network. So the unit is the first part, the scorer is the second part, the decision network. 
Um, yeah, then this, that's all. So you, you say, okay, I want to analyze this, and then you apply GradCam. And this is the result. And what you will realize is um, that if you apply it to very early layers, it will not really tell you something because you're interested in very complex patterns, not edges. Edges are the same for all classes, so edges are not really telling you something. But if you go into the scorer network on the very last unit layers, you can already see, okay, there again patterns. So the water is similar. Uh, here, for example, the natural structures are quite similar, and these are some, yeah, some uh, anthropogenic areas. And as you can see later, uh, GradCam is, um, yeah, it's, I will tell you later, because GradCam, I'm normally not a huge fan of it, but in combination with, the, with our jungle net, it will give good results. Um, normally a convolutional neural network is very like, like, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If you apply GradCam to the very last layer, it will give you a very coarse result. This is what you see in papers. You see images with heat maps and only blobs, big blobs, but we have satellite images. We do not have cats and dogs where we are satisfied with, okay, we huge blob on the dog and it's classified as dog. Surprise, uh, it doesn't work. For, for satellite images. We have more fine-grained structures there. We do not have this background, foreground structure. So, build your own opinion on it. Um, yeah. And this is for occlusion sensitivity map. I will not run it now. You can test it because it will take a while. But again, the only thing what you need to do is, is you need to decide on the sliding window shape. So it's a small, small window for the sliding window. Um, yeah, the target class you need to decide on, and this is just for the plotting. So very easy, Captain library, um, try it out, really nice. Okay, so one, a few last comment. Oh, no, 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 okay, I did, which one was it? Oh, no. This first one? Second one. Great. Okay. So this is what I... Good. Last few minutes. What I want to show you, um, some more insights, because I was telling you in the beginning, okay, you can also discover new knowledge, not only uh, justify the decisions, and uh, staying with the jungle net because it was so nice. Uh, let's again look at this and remember, um, yeah, this is what I did not tell so far. And this is what also confuses people all the time. So uh, when you do explainable machine learning, yeah not always interested in the accuracy. So we do not care about if it's 1% uh, more or less. In this case, what we wanted to was we want to learn a network which is 100% sure of what it does because we defined the extremes. We were sure about the extremes and we needed a network which was also quite sure about the whole decision so that we can analyze more than the insights. So our jungle net uh, did uh, training accuracy and testing accuracy of nearly 100%, which is good. Um, and now we can, um, yeah, because we didn't want to have any uncertainties in the decision process. And yeah, this is what you already saw, this. Okay, let's continue uh, a little bit more. Now you know also the concept about occlusion sensitivity map. That's why I stopped um, before. Uh, and told you first about occlusion sensitivity maps because now we use this principle here, but not in the input space, but in the activation space. What we did is we defined a cube, and for example here, and it's a sliding window cube through the whole activation space. 
And we set all activations to zero in the cube and had a look how the score changes. So what happens if we uh, occlude specific activations? This has the advantage, uh, now it makes sense, because activations you can set to zero. In input, you cannot just delete something. Um, for example, if you have a look at here, at this one, uh, this will lead to this. So everything is set to zero. And if you then uh, do this for the whole space, you get to such a, uh, we call this activation space occlusion sensitivity. So this is the sensitivity towards uh, non-wilderness and wilderness. So here, these green parts, they're a change, uh, they're uh, connected or assigned to or all these all these patterns here in this area uh, are sensitive towards uh, wilderness, and this is to anthropogenic areas. And we have also some areas where nothing really changed. That means these patterns are at the same time typical for anthropogenic, but also for uh, wilderness areas. And the good thing is, also, you can use it as a lookup table, because now you have it, you can feed every image what you what you uh, what you have into it, and um, yeah, just have a look. Okay, this activation that means this sensitivity, so you can translate it. And this is one image from North Ostrobotnia in Finland, and this is the uh, sensitivity map. Again, uh, green areas are, uh, are patterns which speak for wilderness and uh, these. Um, purple areas speak for anthropogenic areas. So this is uh, wetland, that's clear, nobody wants to go to wetland, so there's nearly no human influence, makes sense. Uh, water bodies are quite neutral, which also plausible, but then we had a look at this area and we thought, oh, that's a, that's a dense forest, so why is it now not uh, wilderness typical? And if you have a closer look, it's a, you see patterns in it. It's a man-made forest. And then, that was interesting. So the, the algorithm actually detected that if you have a regular pattern in a forest, it's not wilderness. So this is actually the basis now uh, for yeah, continue our research in this direction. What is uh, an interesting thing we found out? So very often we have problems with uh, communicating our results. So for example, you can, or when it comes to climate change, for example, so you have satellite images. This is already quite nice, but uh, so you, we all know that urbanization and everything is spreading. Wilderness goes, uh, the amount goes decreases. Uh, but you cannot really see it uh, here. This is from 2017, this is from 2020. You cannot really see it. But if you have a look at the sensitivity map or the patterns for wilderness, non-wilderness, it's much more obvious. So it can also give you some kind of representation uh, for a better communication or for even you can play with it and get some metrics and to uh, quantify in how much the, uh, the wilderness decreases over time, something like this. Again, neural networks are good representation learner. You can do a lot of things with it. It's not, they are way more than classification and regression. And this is just a comparison to the input occlusion sensitivity map. And this is, although I'm a good fan, uh, a big fan of it, it did not work for this uh, kind of complex satellite data. Maybe you are more lucky, um, but you can see artifacts and some, because you, you cannot use a big image because you need a small patch, but if you only cover up a small patch, it will not change a lot because it's just nothing will change in this image. So the score will not change. Okay. Um, yeah, just as a last comment, I mentioned already that the combination of GradCam with Jungianet is quite interesting because you can propagate back the gradients exactly to here. So you're already quite close to the decision network. And 
uh, you can you have the same size as the input image, so you have a very detailed uh, interpretation map afterwards. And just to give you a quick impression, so this is uh, the sensitivity space for um, yeah for a, another set uh, data set or a similar data set for this activation space occlusion sensitivity, and this is when you use GradCam and derive the sensitivities from there. And it looks similar. Okay, so, oh, I have 10 minutes left, okay. Take home message and then we can have eight minutes for questions or seven. My take home message. So I, I just give you a quick impression of what explainable machine learning is, what you can do with it. The thing is, it's not new. There's such a big high, but feature importance, for example, is not new. We already did it with Random Forest. It offers a lot of methods which need to be chosen carefully based on the analysis score. So really think what you want to have. There's, for example, sensitivity, but sensitivity will tell you something different than contribution. Um, and then it's connected to uncertainty quantification. This is one research area I'm working on at the moment, uh, not only to have an explanation, but also an uncertainty about the result. And the interesting thing is it goes beyond explaining models um, that are aligned with our given knowledge. So this, again, it can also be used to correct your existing domain knowledge, or you can learn something new, like about the wilderness. But you need domain experts. For example, for the wilderness, uh, we, there are wilderness philosophers. They work in Bonn, and uh, we identified them. I didn't know it's coincidence they work in Bonn at the university. And so we worked with them together, and they helped us to design the data set in a specific way. So I, just to use the extremes, for example, that it's not binary, something like this. So it's not only remote sensing and machine learning. Very often, it's also useful to have a look at the other disciplines. It will help a lot. Okay, with this, I thank you a lot. And here you can find also my YouTube channel with a, a full lecture about this. And of course, my team, they helped me a lot with the preparation and thanks a lot. And questions, we can have a few minutes and you can clap also. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we have seven, seven minutes for questions. Also afterwards, you can ask me. Or you can just have a coffee first and then ask afterwards. That's also fine. I, I yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very much for your nice presentation, and you covered all of the, all the facts in explainable AI and explainable machine learning. My question is about: uh, I wonder uh, your opinions about uh, hyperspectral image analysis, because uh -huh. here uh, most of the examples use the multispectral data yep. set, right? But yep. in hyperspectral uh, data set, the dimension is high. So yes. how? I mean, what kind of you know uh, techniques you can propose us to use in uh, hyperspectral image analysis? Yeah. Actually, one thing I want to do for a long time, but I do not have someone who's doing it. Maybe someone of you has time. Uh, I want to know, you can, you can have a look at the feature importance of different channels, because uh, we assume, for example, NDVI is good for vegetation. Maybe there are different channels, a uh, better combination of it. This is something you can find out with it. Uh, also, it helps for design of new sensors. Uh, for example, if you have hyperspectra and you identify some channels are just not important for specific applications for the decision, then you don't uh, need them. So you can uh, go from there and design new sensors. This is something uh, we are having a look uh, at the moment to design better sensors for aerial, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, for aerial images. Um, yeah, this is, I think, for hyperspectral, because it's so good about uh, or the, the information in the channels, I would go in this direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably the dimensionality would be a really huge problem, right? Uh, what do you think about that, the curse uh, of dimensionality? Because yeah. that's going to be in pixel domain, so yeah. explanation, yeah. The, 
Yeah, the problem is always uh, the, the explanation is only as good as the model. If the model is wrong, it's very uncertain. Also, the explanation is uncertain. Um, this is nothing, it cannot be solved with the explainable machine learning. There's nothing you can do because you can see it as some kind of on top. Um, yeah, it's all about the data. Uh, one, one comment I really want uh, to, to make here. So uh, there's a new research direction, data-centric machine learning, uh, which is not only about looking into the models and the optimizing the models, but optimizing the data. Because I care a lot about explanations and uh, the data is so important. If you really want to uh, do your PhD, on, I hope you really want to do your PhD, but uh, if you want to stay in academia and want to pursue a research direction, which I think is very active in the next years, it's this. And there, uh, the people think about what kind of data needs to be labeled to get a good model. And not only start in labeling, because it's a lot of work. Um, and so I think we all need to think this together. So we have good sensors, we have good models, we are at a point in machine learning, that's, we have it. We just need to think about what is good data and what, how can we apply them. These are the critical questions for all of us here in this room. Um, that's my opinion. So I think we need to go back to the data and think about the annotations to get to learn good models. Thank you very much. Any other question? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, since, as you showed, different explainab explainability techniques would give different results, would you suggest that each time I want to explain my mo model, I would apply many different techniques and evaluate all of them? Or is there one method that is uh, the one to go for, sp maybe depending on the task or the uh, type of the data that I have? To be honest, I work uh, for a lot of years in this area already, there's no, um, I didn't see a, I, here I did not see a pattern. Um, for example, the occlusion sensitivity webs, they work for cauliflower data in the field, uh, they work for whales, but not so much about the uh, uh, satellite images. Sometimes, but I also saw works where it worked. So um, it's, I cannot, at, at the moment, I cannot give an advice, also not really on the evaluation. I think it's just there are a lot of research that needs to be done uh, in the future, especially about when do we know is an interpretation good, um, something like this. So maybe the safer option would be to evaluate many methods for your task. It's better than just go for what's worked for other tasks. I would, if I have a specific task, specific, even if you change the data set, I would always try a few methods, representative methods. For example, if you have occlusion sensitivity and some surrogate modeling, it's, it's good to have representative interpretation methods and to pick one because in this pool, they, they perform quite uh, similar, but there are only a few, a handful of these basic methods. I would go for basic methods and use Captum or something like this, get the first impression and then do it thoroughly. That would be my, or how I would do it. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? No question, we have time. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, one query I have, like uh, when you are given annotation of test to, it, are you giving to the satellite imagery or like how your annotation of image and you're saying that when we are given the correct text and it was identifying properly, when you are giving wrong, it was identifying exactly it was wrong image. So how you are giving, like you are giving for satellite imagery or you are taking like how you are identifying? Um, are you asking about how, how we do, do we know if it's correct what we get in the end? For the yeah, like a beach and school, you give and write some slide. Um, you mean this... Um, Maybe initial stage. This one here? Or which one? Initial, uh, you give a school and a beach as example. Ah, ah, there, there, there. Yeah. Um, 
So we just, so what we did is we just added the text of the label that was done manually, and then we trained the model. What we wanted to show is that it's very easy uh, to, um, th that the, the network would pick up important features. It's the same with JPEG artifacts. Some, all these patterns we do not want to have. The, the network, they find patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and when we changed it to another class, then it was uh, very often incorrectly classified. That's how we, how we did it. Yeah, like you clearly identified that big, the test is identified more than the features already available in there. Like uh, which kind of activation means, which kind of networks it'd be better to highlight the feature rather than text. Oh, I mean, we just train, ah. You mean, can you, can you, uh, I mean, that was a convolution in our network, which is just a pretty toy example. I mean, you can, you can also manipulate the network does it, that it does not pick up something. That's, that's for sure. But we did not have anything related to text. It was just, uh, for us, it was pixel values, no, nothing really text-like. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, the original, uh, the original example. What what uh, can be found in the literature is uh, there was some data set like ImageNet, and they had captions because some f when you take photos, sometimes there's a caption and a label, and it was I think about cars and horses again horses, and uh, as they, the, the network learned that the caption is responsible for the decision, so a horse was identified as car. So it's, it's, yeah, but it can happen with anything else. So we had it with cauliflower and our model looked into the background and the background was soil. So and it was like, we want to classify uh, harvest readiness. If the cauliflower is ready for harvest, so the soil was not an important feature at all, but it picked it up sometimes. So it's helpful for a lot of applications, uh, yeah. Thank you.